Hey guys, welcome back to Westeros. This is Alt Shift X, uh, a live stream to talk about the brand new, just out premiere episode of House of the Dragon, the new Game of Thrones prequel show. Set some 200 years before the original Game of Thrones show. Uh, this is about the Targaryens just, just being really uh, thoughtful and considerate and, and just really healthy and kind to each other all of the time. Um, yeah, no, it's going to be messy and I'm very excited. We're going to do one of these live streams every week at approximately 10.15pm Eastern Time Sundays right after the episode to talk about what happened, what it all means, how it compares to the books, to answer your questions... Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun, so like and subscribe. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so this first episode was like an introduction to the political situation at this time, setting up the main players, giving us a bit of background, um, and I thought they did a pretty good job of, of introducing us to this different time period. You can really see that there's more of a budget, there's a bit more CGI, there's a bit more spectacle going on. Uh, it was reported that George R. R. Martin, uh, the author of the book, had requested several changes uh, to correct things that he didn't like about the original Game of Thrones show. And one of those things was colourful heraldry, um, bright banners, and, and all of the sigils of the different houses. And I thought the uh, tournament scene did a really good job of showing the splendour of this time, because this is meant to be the Targaryens at their richest and most powerful. It's a time of decadence and opulence, and it's a time of, you know, arrogance comes before the fall, you know. Um, I really enjoyed how Rhaenys Targaryen um, in this tournament scene was was talking about these knights as these, you know, men with, with you know, hot blood, and, and they're, they're angry, and they're horny, and they're ready for war, and there's all this, like, pent-up aggression that is being displayed in this sort of, you know, this tournament, this this simulacrum, this play of war, but you can see how it's sort of setting the tension for real conflict coming soon. Um, thanks for the super chat from Atomic, who says, glad to see you back. Thanks for the super chat from Robin Stoops. So I think we're going to attempt to go through this, like, m mostly chronologically. Um, so I think the first thing we should talk about is this introductory prologue scene at the Great Council of Harrenhal in the year 101. So the main Game of Thrones TV show and the main Game of Thrones books happen around the years 298 to 301 uh, AC, after the conquest of Aegon Targaryen, which was in the year zero. Uh, and this council happens in the year 101. So, a hundred years after Aegon's conquest, and two hundred years before Game of Thrones and Daenerys and Jon Snow, is this event. Um, so, this is all about the King Jaehaerys Targaryen choosing the next king. Um, because the whole succession situation with the Targaryens up till now has been, like, kind of a mess. Uh, it has not been organized. I'll show you the family tree, because it's hard to keep track of what's sort of going on here. Here's a helpful little family tree. So. Way back in the day, the Targaryens came to Dragonstone before the Doom of Valyria because of the dreams of Daenys the Dreamer. So, you know, Daemion and Aerion and this whole line of Targaryens lived on Dragonstone, which is the island off Westeros. Then this fella Aegon Targaryen was like, you know what? Let's conquer the continent. Let's burn some blokes with dragons. Let's make a throne. Let's start a dynasty. It'll be great. Um, and, and Viserys talked about, you know, other motivations that Aegon had as well, a prophecy, and we'll, we'll get to that. So then Aegon conquered Westeros, um, and then his son Aenys inherited the throne from him, which is like, fine, great. But Aenys was kind of weak and no one really liked him, and so he died, and then when Aenys died, his brother Maegor the Cruel took over, even though Aenys had children who should have inherited the throne. So right away, like, the whole succession thing has not worked properly. And then Maegor died, and then Jaehaerys, King Jaehaerys inherited the throne, even though Jaehaerys had elder siblings who had children. So, like, even Jaehaerys' claim was not bulletproof. So, like, my point is that it's, it's always been kind of unclear so far who gets the throne after the king dies. And so that's why Jaehaerys held this big meeting to get everyone together and say, hey... What are we doing here? <laughs> Who's going to be the next king? Um, and in the books, there's like 14 different people who could have maybe been the next king. Because Jaehaerys um, and his wife Alysanne had a whole bunch of children. 
he had Amon, he had Balon, Daella, but he also had like a bunch of others. It was like 10 of them or something, heaps of kids. But for various reasons, one or the other of them weren't included and, and weren't um, considered for the throne. Like his, his eldest son, Amon Targaryen, was going to be the inheritor of the throne, but he died. He was killed by pirates in a battle. And then Balon was going to be the king, but then he died of a burst belly, ate, too, ate, ate a bad burrito, he died. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Jaehaerys chose Balon to be the heir, even though Amon had the child Rhaenys. So she almost should have, could have, would have been the queen of Westeros. This is um, Rhaenys over here. But they skipped over her because she's a woman. They skipped over her like twice uh, by choosing Balon. And then ultimately in this council, they chose Viserys over Rhaenys. So that's why she's called the queen that never was. Um, so there's this precedent that's been set. Like for a long time, generally men are preferred over women. And there's never been a female ruler of Westeros. Um but women are still considered to have some claim. Like, this is, it's not super ordered. It's not super structured who gets the king next. Um, and so there's always a certain amount of uncertainty. And that's why it's so significant that at the end of this episode, Viserys chooses Rhaenyra, his daughter, to be his heir, despite the fact there's never been a female ruler so far. So, you know, some people might accept Rhaenyra as the heir. Some people might have different opinions. So this is sort of setting up the conflict of the story. Uh, thanks for the super chat from A. Chernobog, who says, What's up with him cutting himself on the throne? Yeah, so they mentioned that a couple of times, where Viserys uh, has these little cuts and these little wounds on his body. Like, in this moment, he, he cuts himself on the throne. So, the throne is a symbol of power. The throne is the symbol of being the king. And there are several examples throughout the story of kings cutting themselves on the throne. Like, for example, the mad king Ares Targaryen, the father of Daenerys 200 years later from now, uh, Ares, like, cut himself on the throne constantly. Like, he was constantly... They called him King Scab because he was so often cutting himself on the throne. And it's a symbol of the king not being suited for the throne. Like, if the king is cutting himself on the throne all the time, they're not handling their power well. It's almost like the throne is rejecting them. There was a previous king, Magor the Cruel, the uh, uncle of King Jaehaerys, Magor over here. He died on the throne, and it's very mysterious how he died on the throne. Some people believe that Magor, like, accidentally, like, tripped and, like, fell onto the throne, and the swords of the throne, like, stabbed him and killed him. It's more likely that someone just killed him on the throne. But, like, symbolically, there's this sense that Magor was killed by the throne. He was rejected by it because he was such an unsuited, horrible king. So when Viserys cuts himself on the throne, it's sort of saying that, you know, he is a nice guy, he is trying to do his best, but he keeps cutting himself because he can't handle power correctly. That's what it means, metaphorically. Um, Kyle Allison, thanks for the super chat. He says that Alt Shift X is a better YouTube channel. Thanks for the super chat from Rudy. Uh, Night King 01 in a super chat says, One-on-one -on -one fights have really improved since Thrones. Also, Paddy Considine is great, as always. I can't get the fuzz out of my head when... Hot fuzz out of my head when I see him. Was Paddy Considine in Hot Fuzz? I was not aware of that. I need to rewatch that movie. Um, yeah, I thought the fights were pretty cool. I enjoyed uh, the fights at the tournament were pretty cool. Uh, Daemon versus Kristen Cole is a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised that it's, like, okay to, like, oh, sorry, ooh. I'm surprised that it's okay for people to just kill each other on the jousting field. Like, I wasn't aware that that was, like, okay to do. Because, like, at tournaments, they sometimes have melees, which is, like, the time when the knights fight each other. And usually they fight each other with, like, blunted tournament swords and things, not, like, sharp blades that will actually kill each other. Um, like, you're not meant to, like, kill people at tourneys, but apparently it's, like, a semi-accepted... Oh, my God. It's, like, a semi-accepted practice in this case to just, like, be killing people. Um, so that's kind of wild. And also, like, the fact that Daemon Targaryen was fighting Kristen Cole with Dark Sister, a Valyrian steel blade that can slice through armor and, like, slice through swords. That doesn't seem very fair. Why is Daemon using Dark Sister in a, in a tournament fight? Uh, they've sort of upped the violence in these tournaments. Uh, it seems to me. I mean, I guess it's comparable to, you know, in Game of Thrones Season 1 when the Hound attacked... Uh, when Gregor Clegane attacked Loras and the Hound came in and saved him. Like, that's meant to be exceptional. You're not meant to be murking people on the tourney field. 
Thanks for the super chat from uh, Diamond Dog, who says, what are those balls and plates in the meeting? Yeah, that's interesting. So, like, in the small council meetings, uh, each of the councillors puts a little stone into a little little stone plate thing, which seems to sort of symbolise, you know, I'm here, I'm ready for the meeting. Uh, these, little, these little balls that they have. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's an addition. I think it's just a little symbol of just saying, hey, I'm here for the meeting. Um... I'm not sure if it means anything more than that. Uh, Bill, thanks for the don't super chat, who says, does the book cover the entire TV series? Yeah, okay. So, House of the Dragon is a TV show based on the book Fire and Blood. And the book Fire and Blood covers like 170 years of Targaryen history. Fire and Blood starts with Aegon the Conqueror 300 years ago before Game of Thrones, and it ends at a period sort of after this conflict that we're seeing now on House of the Dragon. So the show House of the Dragon is only based on like four chapters in Fire and Blood when there's like 15 chapters or something in Fire and Blood. So House of the Dragon is only based on a small section of Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood is not a novel. It's not like the other Game of Thrones books. It's it's a history book that just sort of gives a brief overview of what happened without much details. So like 90% of the dialogue that you're seeing, a lot of the like characterization, a lot of the details of this story in House of the Dragon are not in the book. That they they are details added on to the broad summary that is given in the book. So, you know, they have a structure, they have a plan. That's what the book gives. Uh, but the writers are filling in all of the details, basically. Um, thanks for the super chat from Malcolm, who says, Viserys' wife was an Aaron. Why does she have Targaryen hair? So, Viserys' wife is Emma Aaron. And as you can see on this handy-dandy family tree, uh, Emma Aaron is the daughter of Daella Targaryen, who married an Aaron. So, Emma is herself half Targaryen. Uh, so, she is actually Viserys' cousin. Um... That's why she looks like a Targaryen. She is half Targaryen. The Targaryens are very incestuous. They often marry their siblings. Like, you know, Jaehaerys married his sibling. Viserys' father, Balon, married his sister. Uh, that's how the Targaryens do it. And that's partly related to, like, their dragon blood. Because it seems as though the ability to ride dragons is something that's genetically in the blood of the Targaryens. Because they come from Valyria, the old empire of the dragon lords. So the incest is related to keeping the blood pure. Uh, and the Valerions are also part of that in the books. Thanks for the super chat from Andy B, who says, How did you find the acting in the show? Um, I thought there was some really nice facial expressions. Um, I really enjoyed Daemon. I thought that Daemon did a great job as like a... I mean, look at that shit-eating smirk. Like, he is just such a shit-stirrer, such a rabble-rouser. He, he can't, he, he's like a sullen teenager or a rebellious teenager who's just like acting out for attention. I was skeptical about Matt Smith being Daemon Targaryen. Like, I can't get Doctor Who out of my mind when I think of Matt Smith. Um, but I, I think that his performance works for me so far. And I also quite enjoy uh, Viserys's performance, um, Paddy Considine's performance. Um, I quite liked even just the moment in the small council when he his voice broke, when he said that, you know, all you people are, like, coming to pick over the corpse of my wife and child. And, like, for a moment, his voice broke when he said that line. And I thought that felt really wonderfully emotional. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am enjoying the acting so far. And, and I think the writing, like, one of the things that I disliked about the later seasons of Game of Thrones is that they sort of abandoned the fancy medieval old-timey language, just sort of the grammar and, you know, almost like Shakespearean stodgy language. Like, it doesn't sound like modern language. Whereas towards the later seasons of Game of Thrones, like, they were just talking like modern people talk. Like, Tyrion's just saying, ah, because I have balls, you're so silly, Varys. You know, like, he's just talking like people talk now. I mean, that's how I talk anyway. Um, so I, I think they're sort of returning to a bit more of a medieval, you know, Shakespearean fancy old-timey way of talking, which I kind of enjoy. Um, thanks for the super chat from Gabriella, who says, it feels kind of weird that Daemon killed a Hightower, asked Alicent for a favor, and then no consequences came of it. I don't think that Daemon killed a Hightower. Um, in the tournament, yeah, they like Daemon defeats a Hightower, and and I like how I like that he did that. Um, like 
Daemon chose to joust against Gwen Hightower, who is the son of Otto Hightower, because he dislikes Otto Hightower, because they are political rivals. So, you know, this wasn't just a bunch of dudes hitting each other with sticks. There was all these sort of, you know, grudges and politics that was inherent in who was fighting who. Um, I mean, it's like this Baratheon guy chose to get the favor of Rhaenys Targaryen, who is herself half Baratheon. Her mother was Jocelyn Baratheon. And the Baratheon names her the Queen That Never Was, which is a nod to what happened back here in the Council at Harrenhal when Rhaenys was skipped over um, in favor of Viserys. So, like, it, it wasn't just senseless tournament stuff. It was reminding us of the relationships and the tensions that underlie this whole situation. I, I really enjoyed the characterization of Corlys Velaryon as well, um, because I like that in this small council meeting back here... Um, uh, the other councillors are talking about, oh, we've got to get this tournament happening. And, like, Viserys is, like, joking and just eating and having a good time. Whereas Corlys is trying to say, hey, by the way, there's a whole bunch of pirates in the Stepstones. They're causing a ruckus. Like, it could be a threat to our wealth and our trade, which is especially relevant to the Valarions because they, uh, you know, got very rich off trade because of their shipping routes through the Narrow Sea. And Corlys is like, hey, like, I think we should do something about this. Uh, but everyone else is too busy talking about, like, party festivities and tourneys and stuff. So you get the sense that Corliss is a guy who wants to focus on getting shit done. Um, he's not joking and eating like the rest of them. And he also declines wine. Like, yeah, this moment here. I like how Corliss just sort of says no to the wine, which is just a really simple way of characterizing him as someone who focuses on the task at hand. Because Corliss, is, of course, is like a famous adventurer. He made his family the richest family in Westeros because of his explorations, because of his ambitions. He's someone who focuses on getting shit done, not on drinking and tournaments. Thanks for the super chat from Brett and from Randy and from Night King. Uh, yeah, the slaughter at the tourney. Yeah, I agree. That was kind of weird. Um... People are asking how long does the show cover? I mean, I won't spoil the overall timeline, but um, th th it's, there's a fairly long span of time that's being covered. And they've said that the show will probably run for like three or four seasons, is their plan. So House of the Dragon won't be as long um, as Game of Thrones was. Um, and yeah, thanks for the super chat from Jeffrey, who says, I'm so happy with how this turned out. Thanks for the super chat from Saeed, who said, Will we get the full history of the dagger, as it was supposed to be handed down to every heir? Was a Targaryen supposed to kill the Night King? Yeah, okay. Let's talk about the prophecy. Let's talk about the prophecy. So, this is a change from the books, or it's an addition to the books, anyway. Um, so, Aegon the Conqueror, we talked about Aegon, 300 years before Game of Thrones, and like a hundred and... 10 years before where we are now in House of the Dragon. This guy, Aegon the Conqueror, took over Westeros. And, like, what the books say is that we don't know exactly why he conquered Westeros, but it's about ambition, you know, it's just what he wanted to do. You know, men have ambitions to power and conquest. That's that's kind of the assumed reason why Aegon conquered Westeros. But George Martin, in interviews years ago, has brought up this idea of maybe... Aegon had a prophetic dream or some prophetic knowledge that the White Walkers, the Others, would attack sometime in the future. The Long Night, the apocalyptic event that threatens all the world, um, which is, is, is something that has happened before, 8,000 years ago, in the first Long Night. And now that's what Viserys in the show says to Rhaenyra. He says that the part of the reason why Aegon conquered Westeros is that he had this prophetic awareness that the White Walkers are going to come one day and that there needs to be a strong Targaryen on the throne uniting Westeros in order to save humanity from the White Walkers. And so I think, you know, that they talked about it in the inside the episode. They're trying to sort of add some stakes to this conflict. They're trying to connect this show to the original Game of Thrones show. Personally, I don't love this change because it reminds it reminds us of The Long Night in Season 8, Episode 3, which was, you know, very disappointing to a lot of people. Like, The Long Night was meant to be a, a, a year of darkness and apocalyptic hordes taking over everything and this ongoing battle and a hero and a sacrifice and a flaming sword. But the Game of Thrones TV show reduced it to just, like, one night... And then Arya Stark came in with that Valyrian steel dagger and killed the Night King, then it was all over. 
um, a lot of people were disappointed by that and it looks like it's going to be very, very different in the books because, of course, the books that Game of Thrones was based on isn't finished. George R. R. Martin hasn't finished the series, which is, you know, a bit of a bloody problem. Um, my point being that, you know, like, th this prophecy that Viserys is talking about, it doesn't come true exactly, does it? Because he's saying that a Targaryen will be the one to save the world from the Long Night. But in Game of Thrones Season 8, it's not a Targaryen, it's Arya Stark, you know? So, you know, and, and he says that there must be a Targaryen on the throne, but in Game of Thrones Season 8, there wasn't a Targaryen on the, th on the throne. Cersei Lannister was on the Iron Throne when the White Walkers were defeated. So, you know... I mean, it sort of fits in the sense that prophecies in the books especially are something that usually come true, but not in the way that you expect. Um, and, you know, that's true of Viserys' other dream in this show, which is also an addition to the story, uh, where Viserys talks about how he has a dream that there's going to be... Uh, he's going to have a son, and that son is going to be on the throne, but, you know, that turns out to be wrong when Viserys' baby son dies. So, you know, and, and of course in the books there's lots and lots of examples of Targaryens having prophetic dreams that often turn out to be... they come true in an unexpected way, they often lead to the downfall of the person, and I think that dreams are a metaphor for ambition and desire, um, and how our ambitions and our desires can be our undoing, which is certainly a theme of this story. So, so both of those dreams and prophecies are not in the book. They are additions to the story in the show. I Personally, I like the one about Viserys believing he's going to have a male son, an heir. I, I think that fits. Uh, however, personally, I, I don't love the Aegon thing. Like, I kind of prefer for Aegon the Conqueror to be... A conqueror. Like, I think it is reasonable that Aegon would have some awareness of the White Walker prophecy stuff, because in the books there is all of this stuff about, you know, there are multiple Targaryens in the books who are aware of this prophecy about the prince that was promised. Like, Maester Aemon Targaryen is aware of this, and, like, um, Rhaegar becomes aware of this. Rhaegar finds in his scrolls these writings about the prince that was promised, and that inspires him to do what he does in an attempt to save the world. Uh, which was its own <laughs> disaster. We've got a video about Rhaegar, we've got a video about a bunch of this stuff. Um, but the point is that, you know, Targaryens have always been aware of this prophecy stuff, so I don't mind if, like, some of the Targaryens are vaguely aware of it, but I really hope that it's not like, Aegon was a great guy who was just trying to save everyone, and, like, all those people who he burned, it was worth it, because it was for the greater good. Like, I don't like that... I don't like making him some kind of hero. I don't like justifying his conquest because Aegon's conquest was very bloody and very ugly, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. I, ho I hope we'll learn more about all this prophecy business as we go on. And yeah, the whole, like, Valyrian steel dagger, the special dagger that the Targaryens have had for hundreds of years, like, we see Viserys wearing this dagger, but in the books there is, like, that dagger is not, like, a super special dagger. Like, it doesn't have this history in the books. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Brett, who says, what are your thoughts in the music? Yeah, I enjoyed the music, specifically in the, uh, this, like, Rhaenyra um, air naming ceremony. I thought the music was really cool there. They definitely leaned a lot on the Game of Thrones uh, soundtrack themes from the original show. Like, they were reusing a lot of those familiar themes. I, I think, like, they're really trying to connect this to the original show when personally I would kind of like it if they did something a bit more different if they distanced themselves from the original show more because a lot of people didn't like the original show like uh, my suspicion if I had to guess is that I think this show probably will be popular for like the hardcore fans and people who have read the books and people who are like really keen for more thrones uh, and I'm sure there are lots of those people but I suspect that like the more casual fans and the more mainstream fans uh, viewers are, are maybe not going to follow this show as closely because, like, I think for people who are not into the lore, this show might be confusing, it might be slow, it might remind them too much of season 8, you know? Uh, because, like, there are a lot of characters with similar names and it's kind of hard to keep track of who's related to who. Like, you need this bloody family tree to know what's going on. So I, I would not be shocked if this show was not wildly popular with some of those people. Thanks for the donation from Sam Riley, who says, Was Otto trying to pimp out his daughter? Yeah, let's talk about that. So, Otto Hightower is the Hand of the King. He's an ambitious, scheming sort of a bloke. Very powerful, very influential. 
Uh, and he he's very reminiscent of Tywin Lannister, I think, who was also Hand of the King in Game of Thrones. He's got very strong Tywin vibes. And Otto, after the death of Viserys' wife, Emma, uh, Otto suggests to Alicent, oh, why don't you go and comfort the king in his chambers? Yeah, go and do that. And yeah, I think you're right to suspect that Otto might have ulterior motives there. Uh, and then Alicent goes and visits uh, Viserys, and I really love that Viserys is playing with, like, this model of Valyria, I suppose. Like, this architecture looks quite similar to Dragonstone, which was also built by the Valyrians. Um, I, I really like, generally, like, the emphasis on Valyria in this show, because Valyria is the old empire that the Targaryens originally came from. Um, and in this show, like, that, the, chronologically, that was more recent in this show, you know? Um... Valyria, the memory of Valyria is still fresh. So, like, in this conversation between Daemon and Rhaenyra, they're talking in Valyrian. Um, and Daemon gives Rhaenyra a Valyrian steel necklace, uh, the steel that was made in Valyria. So I like how the Targaryens are more sort of conscious of their Valyrian heritage and their Valyrian history in this show. Um, and that includes Viserys building a cute little model of Valyria. <laughs> Uh, I quite enjoy that. It's cute. It's like a guy playing with like a model train set or something. Uh, th there's a lot of stuff, you know, in the interviews and the inside the episode about, you know, like Viserys never really should have been king. Like he's just not, he hasn't got the right personality to be king. He's not good at making hard choices. I mean, he says to his council um, at one point that you know, I will not be made to choose between my brother Daemon and my daughter Rain Rhaenyra. Like, I don't want to choose who my heir is. But, like, like Viserys, mate, like, you're the king. You have to choose. The whole point of a king is to make the tough decisions. And Viserys is really bad at doing that. He wants everyone to get along. He doesn't want to piss anyone off. He just wants harmony. But, like, a king needs to make hard choices, and that's Viserys' problem. Thanks for the super chat from Nora, who says, Your channel is one of the best things on YouTube. I love it and your voice so much. Your one-offs like all tomorrows are top shelf, and I'm happy to see new videos. Thank you so much, Nora. Thanks for the super chat from James, who says, I think we can safely assume Nymeria and 10,000 Ships is being seriously backed by HBO. Yeah, so we had a conversation between Rhaenyra and Alicent in the Godswood. Um, so I like I like their friendship. It, it's very reminiscent of um, Sansa Stark and Arya Stark in Game of Thrones and the books, in that Sansa is very rule-abiding and she's a proper noble lady, whereas Rhaenyra is more uh, rebellious. She's described as punk rock in one of the uh, interviews. And, you know, unlike Arya and Sansa, who uh, are rivals and are mean to each other and are not friends... Uh, in the show, Alicent and Rhaenyra are friends, despite their differences, which which I enjoy as a contrast. And this relationship is invented for the show. Like, in the books, uh, Rhaenyra and Alicent are different ages. They don't have this, they didn't grow up together like this. But I enjoy this addition to the show. Um, and yeah, they're reading this book about Nymeria and the Ten Thousand Ships. So, Nymeria was a princess of the Roinar many years ago. And she was part of this ethnic group in the East who were attacked by the Valyrians. And so they escaped from Essos, they escaped from the Valyrians, they voyaged across the world trying to find a new world, a new land for their people, a new homeland. And they eventually came to Dawn. And Princess Nymeria, the leader, married a Dornishman called Mors Martel, and they became part of the Dornish people. Um, and the 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 Roinar people joining the Dornish is part of why the Dornish are different, like ethically and legally and culturally to the rest of Westeros. And one of those differences is that in Dawn, women can inherit just as much as men can. Men and women are equal in inheritance in Dawn, unlike in the rest of Westeros where men come first. Uh, so Nymeria is, is a really interesting story, and there are reports that HBO is working on a TV show about Nymeria and her voyage, which I think could be pretty cool. There's a lot of like adventures and wild stuff that happens in that story. Like Nymeria and her Roinar go to Sothorios, which is like the sort of mysterious jungle continent in the south. And all sorts of, there's like spooky Lovecraftian stone and disappearances and all sorts of crap that goes on that I think would make for an interesting, if expensive, TV show. So, yeah, I think you might be right, uh, James, that the mention of Nymeria and her ships in this episode may be an indication that HBO is taking that 
spin-off show seriously. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Monko, who, yeah, Otto again. Thanks for to Derek, who enjoyed Daemon and Rhaenyra speaking Valyrian. Thanks for the super chat from the American Dream, who says, It's weird to me that Rhaenyra said Dracarys at Emma's funeral to burn the pyre. I thought that was just what Daenerys taught her dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire. No, that that is Valyrian. Um, the Valyrian language is is what the Valyrians had used for a long time to command their dragons, uh, presumably. And yeah, Daenerys did not invent Valyrian. Um, there is a whole like legit Valyrian language that was developed by um, what's his name? Someone Peterson who like created the languages for this show and created Dothraki as well. He created it, not George R. R. Martin, because George R. R. Martin, the author, he's not a linguist. He's not Tolkien. He doesn't invent whole languages like Tolkien did. Um, but he did make some words like Dracarys in the books, and then Peterson created the whole languages based on that. And I believe you can learn these languages on Duolingo. Um, I'm not sure why you'd want to, honestly, but you can. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Sweetness, who says, Doesn't a grand Targaryen White Walker dream remove the mystery of Rhaegar deciding to become a warrior and Azor Ahai? So yeah, as we were saying, like, there is a history of Targaryens being aware of the prince that was promised prophecy to save the world. I, I think it, I mean, I think it fits that, like, it, it makes sense that Viserys may have been aware of this stuff, but, like, I mean, I agree with you that, that telling us this in the first episode of House of the Dragon, it kind of, yeah, it does take away the mystery. It demystifies the whole prophecy thing. Because in the books, it's still very unclear like, who knows what? Like, it's not really clear. Like, is the prince that was promised the same as Azor Ahai? Like, what exactly does the prophecy say? Like, Melisandre says that Stannis is Azor Ahai, and she's had her dreams, and, like, other people have other opinions, and, like, there's other cultures in the world who have uh, other stories about a woman with a monkey's tail, and there's, like, the Bloodstone Emperor who is suspiciously like Azor Ahai. The point being that the story is very sort of mysterious and complicated, in the books and having the first episode of house of the dragon say oh yeah there's frosty boys coming so we targaryens better be ready for those frosty white walkers we we gotta be in charge it's like oh okay you know and showing us the dagger that Arya will use i i do find it a little bit unsatisfying like i can see why they did it because they want to connect it to the show and raise the stakes to an apocalyptic level but i, I kind of like it when the stakes are more human and the stakes are just these are ambitious people who want power, you know? So, I, I don't love that addition to the story. Thanks for the super chat from Actual Goblin, who says that the dialogue had the characters explaining their feelings to the audience too much. I mean, pilots are hard, especially for a story this complicated. Like, like you know, when they made the original Game of Thrones pilot... Uh, it was a disaster, partly because viewers couldn't tell what the relationships of all the characters were. Like, there were people who didn't realize that Jamie Lannister and Cersei Lannister were siblings. Um, so I think that they're trying to make it really clear who the people are and what their feelings are and what their relationships are. Because most people aren't paying that much attention. Most casual viewers don't know all the details of what's going on. So, like, I think it makes sense that they're trying to make it clear, um, especially for the pilot episode, and maybe they can be a little bit more subtle as it goes along. Thanks for the super chat from Evan, who says that Cersei Lannister confirmed secret Targaryen. There are a lot of secret Targaryen theories in the books, for sure. Thanks for the super chat from KB, who says, is this show canon to the A Song of Ice and Fire books or the Game of Thrones show? Yeah, I mean, I think it's closer to the Game of Thrones show than it is to the books. I mean, there are differences between this show and the books, and it is connecting itself to the Game of Thrones show lore, like with that special dagger and the prophecy and stuff. Um, so I, I think that we can consider this more canon to the show than to the books. But I mean, I will note that the, the co-creator and co-showrunner of this show, Ryan Condal, said that their goal with this show is to create a objective account of this conflict, The Dance of the Dragons. Um, in the book, it's presented as a history book where there's lots of different versions and opinions on what really happened during this conflict. There's this guy Mushroom and Eustace who say, oh, that thing happened with Alicent, and that other guy says, no, that thing happened with Alicent, whereas this show is going to present, well, this is what really happened. And, you know, George R. R. Martin, the author, is involved in this show. Like, a lot of the changes and a lot of the things that are added to this show were, you know, approved by him. 
Um, so, you know, like, it is connected to book lore, but it's its own thing. It's not the same as the books. Thanks for the super chat from Musa, who says, Is it possible that the show is going to forgo the Game of Thrones show canon in favor of doing its own thing that's more aligned to the books? Yeah, well, as I just said, like, th th they are doing things that are more connected to the Game of Thrones show lore, like the Valyrian Steel Dagger, and also the Valerions being black is like a change from the books that probably impacts the lore in certain ways. So I, I think it is part of the show canon, as opposed to the books canon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Erden, who says, It seems like the dream of the White Walker prophecy was passed on with spoken word that could lead to alterations, like the telephone game. Or like, yeah, Chinese whispers is another term. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, these prophecies uh, and these histories and these, like, information about the White Walkers, it, it, in the books it's been passed down and passed down over thousands of years. And so, yes, like that absolutely is something in the books that these prophecies have been misinterpreted and altered and lost and fragmentary. And so no, no one really knows what happened in the last long night, the last time the White Walkers attacked. A lot of people don't believe White Walkers ever existed. We don't even know how long ago it happened. Like some people are like, oh, the White Walkers were 8,000 years ago or like others say 10,000 years ago. There are some fans who even question the timeline in terms of, like, when the Long Night happened in relation to when the Andals came, which was, like, an ethnic group that came from the East, and, like, you know, was the Night's King uh, at the time of the Long Night, or was it afterwards because he was the 13th Lord Commander? Like, Game of Th like George Martin really plays with the idea of history and bias and information being lost and forgotten, so that, so, yeah, and misinterpretations of prophecy are a big part of it. Thanks for the super chat from Sam. Thanks for the super chat from Andrew. Um, thanks for the super chat from Sean. Uh, we already talked about Rainier and Allison. Thanks for the super chat from Joseph, who says that the last season of Got we've seen may not actually be the last season. What we saw was a false winter. Can we dream? I remember when Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 3, The Long Night, came out. I, I wanted to believe that that wasn't the end of the White Walker plotline. Because it just seemed so anticlimactic compared to, you know, the, the, the build-up that was in the show and all the information that's in the books. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think we're getting a Game of Thrones Season 9, guys. Although there is talk of a Game of Thrones... Uh, there is talk of a Jon Snow show being made. George Martin and Kit Harington have talked about it. Um, and I, I don't see how that would work. I don't see that being a good idea, personally. But George Martin seems to think a Jon Snow spin-off is a good idea, so... Hell, I don't know. Is it going to just be him hanging out beyond the wall and, you know, being buddies with Tormund and falling in love with another wildling redhead? I don't know what it would be. I, I guess I'm intrigued. Thanks for the super chat from Mucker and from basically a god who says, what do we think about all the new armor and costumes? Yeah, I really enjoy the armor. I mean, something that I've noticed in like the trailers even, like we see Corlys Velaryon wearing a helmet um, and we see Daemon wearing a helmet in this tourney. And, like, helmets were avoided by the Game of Thrones TV show, mostly. I guess because it makes it harder to see the characters' faces. But I like, you know, it's a certain commitment to realism because, you know, the, Game of Thrones attempts to show, like, the real ugly side of violence. Like, people get maimed and injured and people get traumatized. Like, it, it, Game of Thrones is a very violent story, but it tries to show the cost of violence honestly. Um, and I think, you know, part of that sense of weight and realism is is having things like helmets and cool armor and the splendor of all the armor, as well as the ugliness of the violence at the same time. Like, that's sort of an interesting tension that's at the, start, at the heart of the story is that, you know, George R. R. Martin is a romantic who loves the knights and the heraldry and the fantasy and the magic and the beauty of it all. But at the same time, he is so conscious of the darkness and the injustice and the horror and and the consequences of ambition and the politics. And, and you know, so, so that's this fundamental tension where George loves the fantasy, but also is so deeply disillusioned and skeptical and cynical of the fantasy at the same time. Thanks for the super chat uh, from Kat, who says, Anyone reminded of Queen Alyssa's death with Emma's? Yeah, let's talk about that. So, in this episode, uh, King Viserys's wife, uh, Emma Aaron, uh, gave birth to Balon, a little baby who died immediately after being born. Uh, let me just find where that 
bit was. Well, yeah, here's here's the funeral pyre uh, with Emma Aaron and the baby Balon on the pyre. So during the birthing scene, uh, Emma Aaron was having a complicated pregnancy and it looked like she was going to die. And the maester told Viserys that we can't save Emma, but we might be able to save the baby Balon. And so Viserys agreed to have the baby cut out of Emma's belly, which was the only way to potentially save the baby, but they ended up both dying. Now, that is a change from the books. In the books, Emma Aaron dies in childbirth, but there's no mention of cutting her belly open. Um, it was such a such a horrifying scene, watching Emma cut open and die like that. In the interviews, the showrunners have said that Game of Thrones, w- uh, House of the Dragon will do for childbirth, what Game of Thrones did for weddings. Because, of course, there was the memorable and bloody red wedding in Game of Thrones. Uh, And in House of the Dragon and in the book Fire and Blood, childbirth and the violence and the danger and the injustice of childbirth is a theme throughout the book. And so uh, what Kat is bringing up in the Super Chat is that there is this character, Alyssa Valarion, who is Jaehaerys Targaryen's mother in the books. Uh, This woman here, Alyssa... Um, who gets married to a Baratheon bloke later on, and she keeps getting pregnant into her 40s. Um, And the maces are saying that, like, hey, it's it's really dangerous for you to be getting pregnant again when when you're, like, 40 years old. But her husband, the Baratheon, Rogar Baratheon, was like, no, it's cool, mate. She can keep getting pregnant. It's fine. Uh, But then she had these complicated pregnancies, and then she had a baby cut out of her, just like with Emma Aaron. Um, and the baby, incidentally, was Jocelyn Baratheon, who is Rainey Stargarian's mother. So the baby survived in, in in that case. But yeah, this whole choice of, like, will you cut open the woman to try and save the baby, that that's taken from Alyssa's story in the book. And in the book, like, they, they frame it as, you know, they ask her husband, the Baratheon, like, do you want to try and save the wife? Or do you want to try and save the baby? And the husband, the Baratheon, says, save the baby, save my son. And so there's this sense that, like, women are being sacrificed. Women are being killed uh, for the sake of producing male heirs for this power system. And you get the sense that, you know, like, like in this case, Viserys... I mean, I mean, they kind of let Viserys off the hook in, in this case, in House of the Dragon, because they made it clear that Viserys... There was no way to save his wife, Emma, in this case. They could only attempt to save the baby by cutting her open. It's still bloody horrifying the way Emma was, like, like saying, no, please, I'm scared, while she was being killed by the maesters on Viserys' word. Um, but, like, with Alyssa in the books, like, it's really emphasized that they kind of killed her by making her have babies. Like, that's true even of uh, King Jaehaerys' wife, Alysanne Targaryen. Like, King Jaehaerys fathered, like, bloody ten kids on Alysanne, even as she was getting older. And Alysanne told Jaehaerys in the books and said, like, Hey, I can't have any more children for you. Like, this could kill me. Quote, You must be content with the children I have given you. But Jaehaerys, her husband, insisted on, No, I'm gonna have more children with you. And he kept on impregnating her. Um, And it was really dangerous to her health. And then, like, one of their children, Diella... Uh, died in childbirth and Alysanne said that hey our daughter is dead because we married her off too young like we made her bear children too young so like throughout Fire and Blood there's this really strong sense that you know using women to produce babies when it's so dangerous for them when, when it's done when they're too young or too old or just not healthy enough it's it's this horrific violence that is inflicted on women. And, you know, that's partly the fault of the men who keep impregnating them, even when it's dangerous to their wives. And it's also the fault of this whole monarchical system where the stability of this political world relies on the production of male heirs. You need to have lots of babies to inherit your throne, because if you don't have a clear heir, you're going to have a conflict. Um, So it's the system that's wrong, and it's the men who are wrong, and it's the children who are wrong. Um, There's a lot that's fucked up, and and this story in House of the Dragon is partly about this. It's partly about how this power structure, how this patriarchy is dangerous and unfair. And I think it's really cool how they sort of emphasize that in this episode of House of the Dragon. 
And they really showed how Rhaenyra views this because they make it really clear in the show that Rhaenyra has seen that her mother died because of this imperative to produce children. I mean, like Emma in this episode was saying to Viserys, like, hey, this is the last child I'm giving birth to you. I've had multiple miscarriages. I've had multiple stillborns. I can't keep producing babies for you. So like, this is another example of the woman being pushed and pushed to make babies beyond uh, her safety. Um, and, and Rhaenyra in this episode is so painfully aware of that that this system and her father killed her mother, basically. And so that frames Rhaenyra's story around this issue of, like, gender and power in Westeros. And, of course, that's very relevant to when Rhaenyra becomes declared heir. And, you know, some people are not happy about Rhaenyra being heir because she's a woman. So, yeah, those are some of the themes of the story. Um... Thanks for the super chat from Christopher, who says, Do you think we will see... Uh, so that so you're referring to something that's a bit of a spoiler. I'm going to avoid spoilers in this live stream. Maybe we'll have like a spoiler corner at the very end, but I'm going to avoid spoilers. Um, but uh, to answer your question anyway, Christopher, there is stuff in the trailer that uh, confirms your question. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Otto, who says... Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so like, you know, Otto told... Alicent to go and comfort Viserys, and that mirrors something that is in the books. So in the books, uh, Otto was made Hand of the King and in the time of King Jaehaerys, and so Otto brought Alicent to court with him, and in the book, uh, Alicent had a relationship with Jaehaerys where she sort of nursed him and read to him in his last years as he was, you know, heading towards death. And um, in the book, the dwarf jester Mushroom, who is one of the sort of historical sources in the book Fire and Blood, claims that Alicent performed sexual favours for Jaehaerys in the book. And we don't know whether that's true. Um, but yeah, like the sort of uh, Alicent uh, Viserys relationship in the show does sort of evoke that um, Jaehaerys stuff in the books. Thanks for the super chat from Benjamin who says, why isn't Viserys remarrying and having a son? Uh, why is that not a possibility? Uh, well, that's an interesting possibility that may be discussed later on. Thanks for the super chat from Manuel. Thanks for the super chat from Metatexture who says, my dad thought this would be about young Danny, and he's confused about why her parents are alive and where is her crazy brother and what happened to the dwarf? He really wanted to see a young Tyrion. Yeah, well, this is not about um, the characters who were in Game of Thrones. It's about new characters a long, long time back. Which, you know, they had like a text thing. 172 years before the birth of Daenerys Targaryen. The, it, it is conceivable that they could do a show about Robert's Rebellion. Which is about when Robert Baratheon defeated the Mad King Aerys Targaryen and Daenerys was born. Um, you know, they could do that and show us some of the characters we know and love. Um, but, yeah. This is about different characters. Thanks for the super chat from Captain Guts, who says, I really liked the Kingsguard who was watching the princess in the beginning. Will we see more of him? So yeah, we have this character, Harold Westerling, who is the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Uh, and we don't really know much about him. He's just like a honorable, noble guy who likes to follow the rules. Like I like how when uh, he walked Rhaenyra into the throne room and he's and Harold saw Daemon on the throne and he was like gods be good because you know Daemon should not be sitting on the throne um uh, so you know Harold seems to be a sort of a proper guy I also liked being introduced to the dragon keepers um so in the books they mentioned that there are these dragon keepers who are the people who like guard the dragon pit and they wear this fancy armor whereas in this case they seem like they're described in interviews as like an order of monks almost um, and I like how they had this guy who was clearly like a novice dragon keeper who was being taught by this dragon keeper. Uh, they sort of told this whole sort of mini story about these two people in just with, you know, barely any dialogue. Um, I I'm curious to see what else they introduce because some of the sort of dragon lore, dragon culture, dragon infrastructure is mentioned in the books, but we're certainly learning more about it in House of the Dragon. And I imagine a lot of this is based on uh, George's ideas. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Saeed, who says, Can House of the Dragon go back in time to Aegon's conquest, then jump forward to the future, like the Blackfire Rebellion? Yes, so the showrunners in interviews have said that, like, the plan is that, you know, these first three or four seasons are going to cover this particular story about these characters in this time period. 
But if it's, a, if it's a success, they might cover other periods in Targaryen history. Because the book Fire and Blood tells 170 years of history about King Aegon and King Aenys and King Maegor and, and after and also all over the place. So there's, there's a lot of years of history that they could cover. So maybe House of the Dragon uh, will cover other time periods as well. I think that could be cool. Uh, thanks to this, for the super chat from Jim Philbert who says, pour one out for Laenor Valerion. So, yeah, so in this Great Council in 101, uh, there were multiple options considered as to who should be the next ruler. And, you know, yeah, in the books, like, they're not just considering Viserys and Rhaenys as the potential rulers. Even more than Rhaenys, uh, they consider Rhaenys's son, Laenor Valerion, uh, who is this bloke here. And in the books, Laenor is... It, one of the popular contenders, partly because he's the son of Corlys Valerion. And the Valerions are very rich and very powerful and very influential, so they really push trying to get Laenor on the throne. Um, but ultimately, Viserys is chosen instead. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I imagine we're going to get to Laenor later, but this, the whole sort of Valerion story of Rhaenys and Corlys' ambitions and their hopes is, is um, you know, it's going to be relevant. Thanks for the super chat. From Kaiser, who says, Do you think by the end of the story, knowing how the war gets resolved, the prophecy might be lost and not passed on? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's what they might do with this whole Aegon's prophecy thing. Like, maybe Viserys, is, Viserys telling Rhaenyra, like, hey, we've got to pass on this information about we've got to stop the White Walkers. Uh, maybe that will be forgotten. And then maybe that's why uh, Rhaegar rediscovered the prophecy years later, generations later. And maybe that'll add some tragedy to the conflict to come. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I think that... I think that's plausible but i mean like why is this prophecy a secret anyway like why are the targaryens not shouting from the rooftops hey there is a threat that may come from the north at some point so let's be prepared for it let's hand out dragon glass daggers let's you know tell the common people let's create like an almost religious fervor around this apocalyptic vision like why why is it secret you know why are we not uh, reinforcing the night's watch and like telling them telling the night's watch yo like we are aware of white walkers are we got to do something about it like does it does that make sense i don't know why is it got to be a secret you know and, and there's got to be something sort of self-serving in that like the way that viserys tells this prophecy is by saying that you know and that's why the targaryens have to be in charge because of the white walkers Whereas other interpretations of the prophecy do not say, like, and that's why a Targaryen has to be on the throne. Like, when Melisandre says, hey, like, we need to stop the White Walkers, she says, and that's why Stannis Baratheon needs to be on the throne. So just like in real life and in real history, prophecy and mysticism and religion is used to justify whatever political, whatever politician you like, you know? Like, kings all throughout history have had mandates from heaven and, like, mystical religious reasons. Like, the king was chosen by God, chosen by the church to rule. And so, I, I guess in that sense, I like the Targaryens using prophecy as a justification for their political ambitions. Um, maybe it's not quite as selfless as it seems. Maybe it's more politically self-serving. Um, I could see that being a thing. You know, like, everyone centers themselves in their own prophecies. I mean, it's like how, you know, a lot of religious people could be said to have, you know, you believe that you were born in to the people whose religion is the right religion, you know? Like, the religion of your parents just happens to be the right religion, not any of those other religions that other people were born into. But anyway, whatever. It, it'll be interesting to see how this prophecy stuff develops. Thanks for the super chat from Mikey, who says, I love your channel. Fellow book fan, been reading since middle school. What do you think are our chances of seeing Mushroom or Eustace? So, yeah, in the book Fire and Blood, we have these different historical sources. Mushroom and Eustace and Monk and... Um, here's, uh, here's Mushroom, art by Rossi Does Drawings. And uh, Mushroom has all these salacious tales about what went down. Mushroom was a jester to Viserys Targaryen in the books. There he is, Viserys, Paddy Considine in Fire and Blood. Um, and so since Mushroom was there, it, yeah, we may plausibly see Mushroom. I feel like maybe Mushroom 
is just too silly to be like this this show has a fairly serious tone i don't know if they're going to introduce mushroom and like frankly a lot of mushrooms contributions to the story are just kind of cringe like my all mushroom does is says oh that person secretly had sex with that person or that person secretly murdered that person and threw him out a window and there's all sorts of salacious rumors that mushroom spreads that might not be what they're going for in this tv adaptation i mean maybe they could put mushroom in just as like an easter egg like maybe mushroom will just be in the background at a feast or a banquet or something like that would make sense and that would be like a cool nod for the book readers but i'm not expecting mushroom to turn up and have a bunch of dialogue in this show nor eustace um especially since they're not really doing the historical ambiguity multiple sources thing they're doing an objective story so you know Thanks for the super chat from Austin and from Sanguini, who says, I love the parallels between Promise Me Ned and Promise Me Rhaenyra. Do you think that Aegon's dream could be the same to Bran's crow dream when he looks north and sees the others? Yeah, that's a good point. So Viserys in in this episode says to Rhaenyra, promise me that you're going to deal with these White Walkers or promise me that you'll remember and pass on this prophecy. Which, yeah, it's similar to Lyanna Stark saying to Ned Stark, promise me, Ned, promise me you're going to look after Jon Snow, who in the books, uh, incidentally, is looking like Jon will be involved in fighting the White Walkers in the books, unlike in the show. So, yeah, there is a parallel there. And uh, you point out that Bran Stark also uh, sees the cold heart of winter. Bran sees the threat beyond the wall in the books. In the books, every second main character has prophetic dreams and visions, and a lot of people are aware of the, that, that danger in, in some sense or another. Um, and yeah, like, you can also question whether these dreams and prophecies are potentially manipulations by outside forces. Like, in the books, Daenerys has visions of Quaith, who is that masked lady in Karth in the books and in the show. Um, Quaith is able to enter people's dreams, possibly using a glass candle in the books. This is art by Lauren K. Cannon. Uh, and Quaith appeared in the in the show also in season two. Um, so, you know, people are able to send dreams, like, purposefully. And some people wonder if maybe dreams might not just be seeing the truth. Dreams might be you're being manipulated by people. Some people suspect that the Children of the Forest and Blood Raven use dreams to manipulate people. Um, so there's all sorts of, there's like a sinister manipulative aspect to the dreams, potentially. Um, some people suggest that the Children of the Forest might have sent all these dreams. Um, there's all sorts of theories. So, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't imagine that they're going to go deep into the dreams and prophecies in this story, but... I don't know. We will see what happens. Thanks for the super chat from Captains and Paper, who says, If the prophecy was passed down, it might help explain why Bloodraven does what he does, if he's working off the idea that that is the Targaryen's destiny. Yeah, well, there are definitely multiple Targaryens who have been aware of this prophecy or similar prophecies, uh, and Bloodraven is, is one of them. Thanks for the super chat from Maylee, who says, It broke my heart, the look on King Viserys' eyes after he sent Daemon away and saw him leaving. Yeah, I thought that was a nice scene. Like, it sort of makes it clear that Viserys, uh, Viserys and Daemon, they do love each other, but they've just never been able to get along properly or to communicate properly. Like, Viserys sees Daemon as a nuisance, and Daemon certainly makes himself a nuisance. Uh, but Daemon just sort of wants acknowledgement and, and love from his brother, and he's just sort of acting out to get attention. Uh, but in this particular case, like, Viserys is so raw, and he's in grief from the death of his wife and child, and he sort of directs all those emotions and all that grief, and he turns it into rage against Daemon. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a sadness in, like, seeing this relationship break down when it could have been such a positive relationship. I mean, like... Uh, Viserys and Daemon's own father, Balon, was very close with his brother, Aemon, you know? So it, it's a tragedy that this brotherly relationship uh, is is not as close and not as successful. Thanks for the super chat from Spirit, can you say, who says, Can you explain why Daemon went and mutilated all those peasants? I don't really understand. Yeah, that was pretty over the top, wasn't it? Um, so we saw Daemon and his gold cloaks, the city watch of King's Landing go and do this brutally violent crackdown on alleged criminals in King's Landing. Supposedly, like, what Daemon says they're doing is they're going and punishing a bunch of criminals, murderers and rapists and thieves. 
Uh, and so he personally does a lot of the executions and killings. And, and that is in the book as well. It says that Daemon delights in mutilating and cutting up peasants. Uh, so, you know, Daemon's a bad guy. Daemon enjoys violence and, and killing. And he's, he, he's a, he is kind of monstrous. Um, and yeah, supposedly all the people they were killing were criminals, but like, were they really? Like, was there evidence? Was there due process? You know, doesn't look like these people got a trial, did it? So uh, yeah, I, I don't think it seems like a very fair thing. And I think what this is more about is about Daemon exerting power, winning loyalty, instilling fear. Daemon wants power. Thanks for the super chat from my dad, my dad after a bath, who says, Duncan Egg Show on the table, do you think, my dude? Yeah, there has been reporting that there may be a Game of Thrones spin-off show about Dunk and Egg. Dunk and Egg are a couple of characters who exist years after House of the Dragon and years before Game of Thrones, and they're a charming couple of characters who go on adventures. The whole story of Dunk and Egg is much more small-scale than... House of the Dragon and Fire and Blood or Game of Thrones. It's mostly just a couple of, couple of dudes just, just hanging out, traveling, meeting some characters, occasionally getting in a fight, trying to do justice, trying to do the right thing. Uh, you get to see a baby Walda Frey. <laughs> That's fun. Um, I, so I, I think that a Duncan Egg Show could potentially be really cool, um, but one of the issues with that idea is that the Duncan Egg series is not finished. George Martin has not finished most of his projects, um, unfortunately. So I, I think if they try to make a Duncan Egg show, they're just going to have the same problem that they had with Game of Thrones. They're going to run out of books. Because there's been three Duncan Egg novellas published. When George says that he wants to tell their full story, which will probably take eight or ten or twelve novellas, so they've only got like 30% of the story. It would be silly to start a TV adaptation when the books aren't finished. So I would love to see a Duncan Egg story after George has finished the books, but doing it before then seems foolish. Thanks for the super chat from Surfing and Saint, who says, Shout out to the glimpse of Sausage Dog Caraxes, best boy. Yeah, so we got to see a lot of dragons in this episode. Um, Caraxes is Daemon's dragon. He's called the Blood Worm, and he is very long for some reason. Uh, we can see that uh, Caraxes has a very long neck, and he also has wings on his hind legs, which apparently they added according to interviews, because they realized that when Caraxes is super long, he just is not aerodynamic. I mean, I don't know if dragons were ever meant to be scientifically aerodynamic, but because he's so ridiculously long, they decided to add extra wings to the back. In the books, uh, the dragons are all like different colors, um, but House of the Dragon is going even further in making them all unique and distinguishable, because there's like at least a dozen of them who are important to the story. So uh, yeah, we're going to see a lot more dragon stuff. Thanks for the super chat from Epic Mark, who says, Thoughts on Cole beating Daemon by skill and a tricksy weapon being replaced with a cheap shot to the back. Makes him seem dishonorable right away. Um, I don't know what you mean. I don't know if I saw it that way. I thought Kristen Cole beat Daemon pretty legit. Um, but maybe I can rethink that. Thanks for the super chat from Night King, who says, I thought the City Watch didn't get their gold cloaks and name from Daemon. Now nah, he did. Uh, and also Knight points out that the Hightower Knight, Gwen had a chess piece for a helmet. Yeah, I mean, something that the Game of Thrones uh, books do is have a lot of silly armor. Like, there's a guy in the Game of Thrones books who has a, like, a narwhal tusk because he's, like, a unicorn guy. And, like, Tywin Lannister has no less than three lions on top of his armor made out of gold with ruby eyes. Like, the, the drip is over the top in the books like these knights and lords are really trying to show off their house colors their wealth um so they've all got crazy armor and uh, i i do like that they're doing a little bit of that um in this show and yeah that's what you mean the little crenellations on his helmet because house hightower has a very high tower in old town and so that's what that is symbolizing Thanks for the super chat from Sav, who says, We get so much of an idea of Viserys' personality after the maester asked him to choose. He didn't want to. He loved his wife. Dragon dreams destroy his family. I totally agree, Saverna. I really enjoyed the acting when they asked Viserys 
you know, should we kill your wife in an attempt to uh, save your baby son? And I loved the way that Viserys sort of looked away. He looked to the side, he looked up, he looked down. He looked like he was trying to escape from the conversation. You know, he just did not want to make a decision. He felt trapped by his responsibility. He felt weighed down by his responsibility. He does love his wife. He also feels a duty to sire a son and to fulfill the dreams. And yeah, I think that totally fits in with this whole sense that the dragon dreams are what destroy the Targaryens over and over and over. Maester Aemon said that dreams killed my brothers, every one. And these dreams are so often about ambition and wanting to be more. And it's that ambition that gets people killed. And I think that is um, a theme of the entire story, for sure. Um, thanks for the super chat from Rapture and James, who says, The Jon Snow sequel could be about him leading the resistance against a force like the Scargosi or the Ibanese. Yeah, there's lots of sort of things they can make up for the Jon Snow sequel, but it all just seems like a sort of a weird epilogue, a vestigial extra tacked-on story. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, Night King in the super chat says, they said no gratuitous sex. So we did see a bit of a orgy situation with uh, Daemon Targaryen uh, buying out a brothel for his city watch to win their loyalty. And I thought it was very funny the way Daemon was sitting there in the middle of the orgy, fully clothed, just drinking wine and being a sad boy. It reminded me of that meme of like that guy standing in the corner at a party thinking, Ugh. They don't even know that I'm the prince of the city. I have a dragon called Caraxes. I don't know. I thought that his acting was kind of funny. And also in an earlier scene where he was having sex with Mizaria, um, I thought it was interesting that like Daemon, it, it seemed as though Daemon, he like stopped having sex midway through as though he like couldn't get satisfaction. He couldn't get off with Mizaria. And that is a nice metaphor for Daemon's personality. He is unsatisfied. He can't get no satisfaction, as the Rolling Stones once said, and that is sort of what Daemon's about. Like, he has this unfulfilled need, um, and he has this energy that he needs to get out. I mean, it's like Rainy said at the tournament scene. She said something about, like, all these men have so much seed in their balls, or something crude like that. And it's kind of true. Like, there is this pent-up energy in all of these men, and that pent-up energy is uh, causing destruction. Thanks for the super chat from Gustavo and Princess, um, who said that my mum had a C-section with my brother in a developing nation, and it wasn't done properly. Emma's death gave her bad flashbacks, and she called it murder. Yeah, damn. Well, yeah, it does feel like that. I mean, in this case, when they're cutting open Emma Aaron, they know that it's killing her, uh, and it's messed up. Thanks for the super chat from the old gods who loves the Dune video. Thanks for the super chat from Capt who says, "Glad you're live. The Dragon Keepers were interesting. Really enjoyed episode one." Uh, thanks for the super chat from Raphael who says, "My biggest problem with the House of the Dragon is that it will lead to what people hated about Game of Thrones." Yeah, it's weird to link it to season eight. Um, something else I'd like to say about the Tony at Aaron Hall. So I mentioned that there were a bunch of different people considered to become King Jaehaerys's heir. Um, in the show here, they mention Princess Rhaenys, who is the eldest child of King Jaehaerys' eldest son. Um, in the books, they also mention Vagon Targaryen, who is a... Uh, well, Vagon is the oldest living son of King Jaehaerys, so he was kind of considered, but they didn't choose Vagon to be the new king because he was a nerd who no one liked, <laughs> basically. Vagon Targaryen was a maester. Um, and maesters swear not to be the king and stuff like that. And Vagon is just like a very dislikable guy. So he was sort of considered, but he didn't become king. Um, another person they talked to was Sarah Targaryen, who is a daughter of King Jaehaerys. And Sarah ran off and joined a brothel and became a sort of a sex worker queen in an eastern city. And they asked Sarah, like, hey, like, do you hypothetically maybe want to, like, come home and, like, be queen, maybe? And she was like, nah, 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 I, I have my own kingdom here. Jaehaerys had a really uh, complicated and unpleasant relationship with Sarah and with several of his children. King Jaehaerys is widely seen as, like, a really good king who did a lot of good stuff, reformed laws, built roads, did justice, brought peace... 
but he had bad and complicated relationships with some of the women in his life and you know constantly fathering uh, children on his wife Alisane in a way that endangered her health is part of that um, and yeah this whole like succession issue this whole crisis of who becomes king after Jaehaerys is arguably partly his fault for having so many different children and grandchildren who all have these competing ambiguous claims something else I was curious about is that we didn't see an opening theme we didn't see an opening intro sequence for this show um, I thought that you know, like Game of Thrones, da 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 da, when it when it pans over the map and everything, there was no new opening sequence for this show. Maybe we'll see it next episode. Um, I really enjoyed when they were introducing the Red Keep, uh, when Rhaenyra and Alicent were coming in, and we saw all of this splendor. We saw all of these different people, these lords and ladies and courtiers in the Red Keep which is something that was missing from a lot of Game of Thrones, I think. Like, there's a sense that the Red Keep is a really vibrant place, and that speaks to the influence and the busyness and the, and the, how many Targaryens there are and how many people there are. I really enjoy the splendor that they have here. Um, and, by the way, the, uh, this particular courtyard that they're standing in right now is part of the room in the Game of Thrones show where Cersei paints that map. Here it is in um, season seven. It looks like the same room over here. You can see these same arches and columns. So this is the same place 170 years earlier. So I like how they, I, I like those little subtle ties. Like it's the same place. Same throne, different game. Thanks for the super chat from Sean, who says the Baratheons were cousins to Aegon the First. They reasonably have dragon blood in them, playing by Song of Ice and Fire rules, would be able to ward off the White Walkers. Yeah, I mean, lots of people have intermarried with the Targaryens, and yeah, the Baratheons have more than most. Um, so maybe bloody Gendry should have killed the White Walkers. Thanks for the super chat from Christopher and from Nick. Um and from basically a god who says, in theory, is Melisandre alive right now? Ooh, that is an interesting question. Um, Melisandre is very old. We don't know how old. She was apparently a slave in the East, in a shy at one point. Her original name was Melanie. In the Game of Thrones TV show, we saw that Melisandre has like this very old body that she's, like, concealing with, with magic or something. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I guess plausibly Melisandre might be alive at this point, 170 years before Game of Thrones. Um, uh, maybe she'll turn up. Maybe she'll do a cameo. Maybe we'll see Kinvara. I don't know. Thanks for the super chat from Idlingham, who says, Will Altrift be making another Westworld rant video? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea what Alt Shift X might do. I have not made Westworld Season 4 videos. Um, I would like to watch Westworld Season 4 at some point. I heard that it's good. Um, but yeah, not what I'm working on right now. Libertas says, will there be explained videos for this show? So yeah, the plan is that every week we'll do a live stream like this immediately after each episode of House of the Dragon at 10.15pm Eastern Time every Sunday. Uh, like and subscribe, press press the bell so you get notified, uh, and we will then make a explained video which is going to summarize and analyze each episode, and I expect that'll be out around Thursday or Friday each week, hopefully. Uh, depends how much happens and how much there is to discuss. Thanks for the super chat from Malcolm. Uh, do you have a desktop full of fan art for these streams? Um, yeah, there's a system. <laughs> As a system. Uh, thanks for the super chat from KCLV, who says, Daemon, fighter of the nightman, champion of the sun, you're a master of karate and friendship for everyone. Uh, yes. <laughs> Kryptonian says, how did the newborn baby die? Uh, it doesn't say, but, you know, that's something that happens, even in the real world. Sometimes babies die. It's um, one of the biggest things that's changed with modern medicine. Like, they talk a lot about how... Um, average life expectancy has changed dramatically like average lifespan is much longer now than it used to be in the past and one of the main reasons for that is that healthcare and medicine and science has made babies survive their first five years much more often it used to be that babies died in their early years much more often but that doesn't happen as much anymore and 
the Game of Thrones world is trying to be sort of realistic to that uh, by showing the dangers of childbirth. Thanks for the super chat from Midtoker, who says Matt Smith was great. Is it just me, or was the CGI way worse than the original show? I thought some of the CGI was a bit suspect in this show. Like, specifically when they burned the Emma and the baby on the pyre. Like, that CGI looks a bit shit, doesn't it? Is that just me? It, it doesn't look good, to, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, so, uh, yeah, some of the CGI wasn't great, which I'm surprised by. Like, I thought they were spending, like, an absurd amount of money on this, but, um, I, I thought overall it looks good. I thought, like, the production design and the costumes and the sets and the armor are all pretty good. But yeah, some of the dragons and the CGI, not so much. Thanks for the super chat from Robbie, uh, and from Brinks. Thanks for the super chat from Seren, who says, The scene where Viserys had his hands on the flames, an ability that not every Targaryen had. Yeah, so we did have Viserys uh, putting his hand on some candles here, which is interesting because, like, something that has always been a little ambiguous and a little bit different between the TV show and the books uh, is that Targaryens in the books are sort of resistant to heat. Like, Daenerys takes really hot baths and Egg in Duncan Egg is not bothered by, like, a really hot summer day. Um, in the TV show, some Targaryens are straight up immune to fire. Daenerys gets immolated several times, uh, just wreathed in fire, and she's unharmed and unburnt several times. Uh, and when Viserys is burned to death by molten gold, Daenerys says he was not a true dragon. Uh, fire cannot kill a dragon. So it seems that in the show, some Targaryens, but not all Targaryens, are fireproof. Whereas in the books, Targaryens are not fireproof, but they are generally resistant to heat. I mean, like, holding your hand over a candle flame, I mean, you, you can do that. Like, I don't think this necessarily means that Viserys is, like, fireproof. But, um, yes, it is an interesting and provocative thing to do. And I think it sort of raises that question of, like, is Viserys a true dragon? Can Viserys be burnt? And I tend to think that the answer is no. Like, well, it is... I, I think the Viserys can be burnt, like, metaphorically, if not literally. Like, metaphorically, I think touching the flame is about, like, getting close to fire and getting close to power. Um, and I think that Viserys, in some ways, does not succeed when he gets close to power. So, yeah, I think that is sort of what they might be going for, metaphorically, with that. I like that this scene took place in front of the skull of Beleriand, the Black Dread, who was the largest and biggest and baddest Targaryen dragon. Who, who was so large that his shadow would, would, would throw entire towns into darkness when Beleriand flew over them. Beleriand was the only living creature who had seen Valyria, um, which was the old empire of the Dragon Lords before it was destroyed in the doom of Valyria. Uh, that's what Viserys was making that little model of, apparently. is It's a model of the old empire of Valyria, the city of Valyria at the center of the empire. And Beleriand came from Valyria. He's possibly the oldest living creature in the world. At least he was until he died. In the uh, Fire and Blood book a long time ago, there was a Targaryen princess called Aria Targaryen, and she flew off on Beleriand, but she was too young to control Beleriand. And Beleriand apparently, seemingly, flew to Valyria, the, the burned and charred remains of Valyria after it had been destroyed in the Doom. Um, and some really scary, mysterious, messed up stuff happened to Beleriand and Aria in the book. Um, it seems as though there are these monstrous, magical, terrifying things that now live in Valyria. And um, Beleriand saw that, went back to his home again. So there's all sorts of cool mysteries about that stuff. And of course, you know, Beleriand is interesting for Viserys because, you know, Viserys was a dragon rider. Viserys rode the biggest, baddest Targaryen dragon, uh, but then Beleriand died of old age. And Viserys now says that, Viserys now says that, like, we can't control the dragons. We should never have trifled with the dragons. The idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. And so Viserys is very, very aware of the danger of dragons. And, like, the whole book, Fire and Blood, is just full of examples of dragons 
killing zillions of people, burning castles, eating people, fighting each other. Like, dragons are a terrifying, destructive force. And that's something that we saw in the original Game of Thrones show as well. Um... So, you know, and I think that, again, that's a metaphor for power and the inherent dangers of power. And that's what the Iron Throne symbolizes as well. It's, it's, a, it's a pile of swords that cuts you if you sit on it. Viserys says that it's the most dangerous chair in the realm. So it's all about the dangers of power. Thanks for the super chat from Musa, who says, Thoughts on the ambiguity of the air for a day statement. Yeah, so, after the death of... Emma and Emma's baby Balon. We see Daemon having a orgy in a brothel, and Mazaria prompts Daemon to speak, and he sort of toasts the dead baby Balon. And Otto says that Daemon said that Balon was the heir for a day, and Viserys gets really angry because it seems like Daemon is mocking Viserys's dead baby. Um. And it's interesting that we don't actually see Daemon personally say uh, air for a day. Um, it, it, I guess there's kind of some ambiguity there, but like Viserys confronts Daemon and said like, hey, did you say this mocking stuff about my baby? And Daemon doesn't deny it. So I think that he did say it. Um, but it's interesting that Otto Hightower is the one who brings this to Viserys and says, hey, your brother Prince Daemon said this fucked up thing about your dead baby. Um, and you can definitely see that as Otto deliberately trying to undermine Daemon and Viserys' relationship. Because Otto and Daemon are political rivals, Otto does not want Daemon to get the throne. So I think that Otto was kind of creating conflict between Daemon and Viserys, and he succeeds, and Viserys sends Daemon away. So, um, Otto is a pretty conniving Machiavellian dude, for sure. And it's interesting the role that Mazaria plays in that as well. Um, thanks for the super chat from Seren, who says Emma was an Aaron, but they gave her Targaryen hair. That's because Emma's mother um, was a Targaryen in the books. Thanks for the super chat from Colin, who says, I'm really excited about this show. I'm sure that the long-term Song of Ice and Fire story will have a really cool ending and nobody will be mad. That is why I don't love the prophecy thing, because it reminds us of Season 8, Episode 3, The Long Night. I thought it's funny that there are these sexy tapestries around the Red Keep. Uh, in this scene, you can see uh, there's these tapestries there, and there's a tapestry over here of a bunch of people having sex, and that's just, like, in people's bedrooms. There's just, like, these sexy tapestries. And in interviews, uh, Alicent and Rhaenyra's actors were saying that uh, some of these tapestries depict humans having sex with dragons, which is interesting. Uh, because in the books, like, there are references to, you know, the Valyrians, uh, who the Targaryens and the Valyrians descend from. The Valyrians believed that they were literally descended from dragons. Like, some Valyrians actually, like, had sex with dragons, and that's why Valyrians and Targaryens have the blood of the dragon, and they have this bond with dragons, because they are blood-related. Uh, and there's also hints in the books about the Valyrians performing blood magic and creating experimental chimeras and monsters that are multiple species bred together, uh, it's possible that dragons themselves were created from wyverns, which are these natural sort of reptile creatures. Um, and by experimenting on the wyverns, they created dragons. So it might not have been like literally just like boning a dragon, but it might have been some kind of blood magic dark sorcery that was done by the ancient Valyrians to create dragons and to create this blood magical connection between Targaryens and their dragons and that's why only the Valyrians are able to control dragons um, and this you know tapestry that includes humans having sex with dragons might be a, a nod to that I mean there's also stuff about how you know the Starks and the people of the north and the first men have this unique ability to warg and to skin change and to control animals like how Bran Stark does uh, and it is possible that that is the result of similar magic or similar interbreeding between the Starks and animals, or the Starks and Children of the Forest, or the Starks and White Walkers, and there's all sorts of 
arcane mysteries there for sure uh thanks for the super chat from ethan who says how many seasons will this go for uh the showrunners have said three or four seasons for this story um i like how they played the rainiero emma relationship like this is something that isn't really in the books we don't hear much at all about emma in the book uh, but Rainier is really showing us this connection that she has with her mother before she dies and sees how this horrible world treats women and her mother in particular. And that creates context for Rainier's political ambitions. Thanks for the super chat from AJ who says, wouldn't Duncan Egg be a better spin-off after House of the Dragon? Uh, I think they should finish the book series first before they start adapting Duncan Egg. Uh, I like how they had this moment where Rhaenyra was talking to Emma and uh, Emma was saying, you've got to be a noble lady, you've got to produce babies for men because that's the role of noble ladies. Uh, Whereas Rhaenyra says, I don't want to produce babies, I'd rather serve as a knight and ride to battle and glory. And that's a lot like what Arya Stark says in season one of Game of Thrones and in the books when she tells Ned, that's not me. I don't want to be a wife. I don't want to be a noble lady. Um, I want to have adventures and travel the world uh, and explore. And so that rejection of gender roles is something that Arya and Rhaenyra share. And I think it's also a similarity that Rhaenyra has with Cersei. Because Cersei's story is very much about how frustrated and angry she is that she isn't able to have power in the way that a man would. Um... I really liked how they introduced Viserys by, like, him telling a joke. Like, the first time we tell Viserys, he says, uh, So I said to him, I believe you might be looking up the wrong end. And he's, like, eating food and just hanging out and laughing. And, like, that, you know, Viserys is just this sociable, fun guy. Um, And that's a contrast to a lot of the serious political players. Uh, It also is sort of reminiscent to King Bobby B in Season 1 of Thrones. Um... I liked, yeah, I liked the characterization of Corlys and Otto and the emphasis on Valyria. I thought that this scene where Daemon gave Rhaenyra a gift was quite interesting, the way it was shot and framed. Like, I thought that Daemon looked quite possessive of Rhaenyra, the way that he, you know, put the necklace on her. Uh, And this is stuff that's drawn from the books, like Daemon gave gifts to Rhaenyra and they had this closeness and I thought I quite liked the way that was done and how they introduced the Valyrian steel necklace. Um, It's really interesting that in this scene Alicent and Rhaenyra are in the Winterfell Godswood and sorry the Red Keep Godswood um, because a lot of noble families and a lot of castles most of them have Godswoods which is where you go to worship the old gods because the original Uh, religion of the first man in Westeros was to worship the old gods, which you do by worshipping at a weirwood tree, a heart tree in the godswood. And then the Andals came and they brought the faith of the seven, which is like Catholicism, and it sort of overtook and replaced the old gods in the first man. A lot of the weirwood trees were cut down and burned by the Andals. Um, And now Westeros is in this situation where most of the houses follow the seven, But some of the houses, especially in the north, follow the first man and the old gods. In the books, there is no weirwood in the Red Keep godswood. I think it's an oak tree that is the uh, heart tree now. Uh, But it's interesting that there's a weirwood here. So, you know, I guess that might just be... They're trying to give us a sense of similarity um, to the show. Because, you know, we saw the Winterfell uh, heart tree quite a lot in season one. Like, we saw it in some of the opening scenes of the show when Ned Stark and Catelyn um, had that scene in the in, in the Winterfell Godswood. So maybe they're just sort of trying to draw a parallel there. But it's, it's an interesting change to add that, and I wonder if it might go anywhere. Um, I liked Rhaenyra's line that she wants to fly on dragons, see the wonders of the world, and eat only cake. Uh... I liked this sort of recurring thing about the wounds on Viserys from the Iron Throne. Because, like, the idea that the throne is continually cutting him suggests that he's not handling power well. It suggests that there's something rotten in the state of Denmark, you know? Like, there's something wrong here um, about Viserys' rule. 
I thought it was really interesting that in the conversation between Viserys and Emma, Viser- uh, Emma said, ooh, I, she, she made a joke that she's like, oh, maybe I'll hatch an actual dragon. Maybe I'll give birth to a dragon. Which is interesting because the Targaryens actually have a long history of giving birth to babies that have dragon-like features. Uh, there are babies born to Targaryens who have dragon wings and tails and scales like uh, some of Maegor Targaryen's children. And Daenerys, uh, in the books, gives birth to this stillborn baby Rhaego. None of these, like, dragon babies have survived. They're, they're all, like, described as deformed and, and, and twisted and stuff. Um, but it, it keeps happening. And that might be due to the blood of the dragon that the Targaryens have. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's related. Sometimes it is, is sort of like a, a hint of, like, evil or something's wrong with this character. Um, and so that sort of connects to Emma saying, maybe I'll hatch a dragon. And it's like, well, maybe you will, Emma. Maybe you will. I thought it was interesting and unusual that they, they drew some parallels between Rhaenyra and Visenya who was one of the sister wives of uh, Aegon the Conqueror. They they said that, you know, we already have a Visenya. Um, and comparing Rhaenyra to her is kind of interesting, because Visenya was a warrior woman. She was possibly a little bit of a sorceress. She was very um, intense, kind of a, a bit evil, I would say Viserys was. Visenya was. Um, so I thought that was an interesting parallel to make. They also sort of contradicted themselves when... Rhaenyra was saying to Alicent that she wants Emma's baby to be a male, whereas Emma in this scene says that Rhaenyra wants uh, Emma's baby to be a female. Maybe Rhaenyra is just saying th- different things to different people. I don't know. Um, I require coffee in a super chat. Says is Viserys's joke the punchline to Tyrion's joke? Because yeah, in the um. In the Game of Thrones show, Tyrion tells a joke about I brought a honeycomb and a jackass into a brothel and we never get to hear the uh, punchline. So could the punchline be you're looking in the wrong end, uh, which is what Viserys says in this scene? I don't know, maybe. You might be looking up the wrong end. Could that connect to the joke about the honeycomb and the jackass? Maybe. Maybe we're just going to get like different fragments of this joke throughout the shows. I don't know. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Sir Akimandud, who says, what's the story with Cole, and how do you think he'll play a part with the princess? I don't want to give any spoilers, because, you know, the whole story is in the book. Um, but I thought it was kind of interesting that they said that Kristen Cole is Dornish. Like, in the books, he's from the Dornish Marches, which is, like, sort of the, the borderlands between, like, the Stormlands and the Reach and Dawn. Um, and I thought it was weird how, like, they looked at him and they're like, oh, wow, he's Dornish. And it's like, is that a Dornish face? Like, I guess he has sort of, like, dark hair and darkish features, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, he's like a low-born dude. He's got a lot to prove. He's, he's got a lot of advancement to make. Uh, he's come to the attention of the royal family, so there's a lot of potential for advancement there. And um, he's clearly um, made an impression on uh, Rhaenyra and Alicent. So, uh, yeah, be interesting to see what he gets up to. I really liked Emma's discomfort with Viserys's, um ambitions. Like Viserys said, oh, I had a dream that our son was born with a crown on his head. And, and Emma is like, God spare me. Like, the last thing that my baby needs is a crown. Um, and there's this sense of these long-suffering women who are being dragged along with the ambitions of men. Um which I enjoyed. Like, th- like so much of this story is just about the folly of ambition and the dangers of wanting power. And, you know, Amon's brothers who were killed by their dreams is an example of that. Um, I thought Daemon was really funny throughout. Um, I thought, you know, in these scenes where he was on the small council, just, just provoking Otto and just stirring shit. And, you know, Viserys tries to lay down the law, Viserys tells him, you know, if you do this again, it will be answered. And then Daemon just gives this sort of smirk. Like, that is the cheeky smirk when he's being told off. Like, he's such a rebellious little sly teenager, is how I see his performance. Um, And he says, oh, understood, your grace. But, like, he doesn't seem as though he really cares all that much about Viserys' instructions. 
Um, I thought it was interesting that Miss Missaria, uh, Damon's lover, suggested that she get a blonde maiden for Damon to have sex with. Um, isn't it interesting that Damon has a sexual interest in blonde maidens specifically? Um, I think that the whole concept of summer nights is relevant to the knights in this tournament when like Rainy when Rainies was saying that you know these are all men who have never been in a real war they're all naive and it's very similar to a conversation that Catelyn has with Brienne in book 2 when you know Brienne is all caught up in the splendor and the glory and the ambition of Renly's camp when Renly is trying to take the throne in book 2 and Catelyn says that these are summer nights. They have no idea about the realities, the horrible realities of violence and war and winter and death. And so there's this sort of naivety that is going to be followed by violent disillusionment uh, is definitely a sense that we get here. Thanks for the super chat from Nick, who says that the Godswood are typically in the north, which is cold. We know Martin worked with the showrunners. Winds of winter, Christmas 2022 confirmed. I, I think it adds up. I can't disagree with your logic there. Winds of Winter any day now. Winds of Winter is the upcoming next book in the Unfinished Book series. Thanks for the super chat from Amy, who says, Do you think they may show Aegon the First in this series? I mean, Aegon's been dead for a hundred years, so, you know, he's probably not in a condition to uh, appear on screen. They might have flashbacks to him, I suppose. Um, but maybe they're trying to keep their powder dry in case they ever want to make an Aegon's Conquest TV show. If House of the Dragon is successful, they said they might cover other time periods. Maybe they could make a show about Aegon's Conquest. I think that could potentially be interesting. Thanks for the super chat from Ethan, who says, Do you think there's any correlation between the Mad King saying burn them all and him knowing about the threat from the North? Yeah, so there is some speculation that, like, the reason why the Mad King was shouting burn them all in his madness before his death was that he was actually having visions of the White Walkers, and um, he was trying to say, burn the White Walkers. To me, that feels a bit convoluted, um, but in some ways it sort of fits. Like, I think some people speculated that Bran Stark might be giving the Mad King Aerys those visions, um, and so there's sort of this tragic accident in, like, Bran Stark causing the Mad King's madness. But, like, the Mad King had been mad for a long time, like, gradually, and there's no mention of him having those sorts of dreams. Uh, but, I mean, certainly, like, this whole thing about the Targaryens knowing about the White Walkers, it, it does invite us to reconsider a lot of the Targaryens throughout the timeline. So, you know, that that might provoke some reconsideration. But, I mean, it's already in the books. They've just made it less mysterious, which, yeah, I don't love. Um, I like how Otto fucked up in putting Daemon in charge of the City Watch. Um, because, like, Viserys points out in these scenes that, you know, originally Daemon was the master of laws, but then Otto said he shouldn't be the master of laws because he's a tyrant, and then so they made him the master of coin, and then Otto said he shouldn't be the master of coin because he's spending all this money, so then Otto suggested he be put on the City Watch, and then now he's causing a ruckus as the commander of the City Watch. And so, like, Otto is constantly trying to, like, remove Daemon from power, but Daemon always finds a way to create havoc with whatever position he is in. And, you know, Otto sort of uh, fucks up by putting Daemon in charge of the Gold Cloaks because now he's arguably as powerful as ever. He's got, like, quite a loyal force of these well-armed Gold Cloaks who appear fiercely loyal to Daemon. He calls them his hounds, and they are cheering for him, and he buys out brothels for them. So Daemon has power, military power, in the heart of King's Landing as a result of this. So, um, well, I guess he did. He's been sort of sent from King's Landing now, so maybe he no longer has that power. Thanks for the super chat from Lucas, who says, Dragon show good. Thanks for the super chat from Alan and from Secularis, who says, what do you think the story is with the Iron Thrones appearance in the show? Is it an attempt to make it more like the books, or is it a visual allusion to the Targs adding more swords to the pile? Yeah, so like originally in the original Game of Thrones show, the Iron Throne was quite small compared to how it looks now. It looks very grand now in House of the Dragon. It's got lots of swords. Um, I, I think that, you know, like it could plausibly make sense that, you know, when Aegon the Conqueror uh, created the 
Iron Throne 300 years before Game of Thrones. Uh, it was huge because it was lots of swords, and maybe like over time the Targaryens removed some of the swords and made it a bit smaller, made it a bit more practical, until by the time of Game of Thrones Season 1, uh, the throne is much smaller indeed. Um, I think that's like a perfectly reasonable like story justification for how it all happened. Because um, this is how the throne looks in the Game of Thrones TV show, the original show. Um, whereas in the books, it, it just has always been massive. Um, and the idea is that it's this monstrous symbol of war and danger and power and the, and the Sword of Damocles. You ever hear the legend of the story of the Sword of Damocles, which is like there's this king who sits on the throne and above the, the king's head is a sword hanging by a thread above his head. And the idea is that that shows that at any time the sword could drop on you. At any time, if you're in power, you could be killed at any moment. Power is inherently dangerous. So I think of the Iron Throne as like sort of a bigger version of the Sword of Damocles. The swords of Damocles forged into one. I've also heard in interviews and stuff that the House of the Dragon throne, um, all of these swords, some of them are taken from the productions, from the set departments, from the prop departments, of other Hollywood fantasy shows, like the Warcraft movie had a bunch of swords, and some of the swords from the Warcraft movie are in this Iron Throne. So, like, in the same way that Aegon the Conqueror made the Iron Throne from the swords of his defeated enemies, they say that House of the Dragon has used the swords of rival fantasy shows to forge its own power, which is symbolically fun. And I'll note that the Lord of the Rings uh, TV show is coming out in a week or two. So that is, uh, some see that as a rival to the House of the Dragon fantasy show. Thanks for the super chat from Sir Akia, Akia Madud, who says, Speaking of Otto, do you think he's pimping his daughter or is he just planting the seed? Alicent has something going on for sure. So what are Otto's intentions in sending Alicent to go and visit King Viserys in his chambers? Well, yeah, well, you, you certainly can question what Otto's motivations are there, but I don't want to be spoiling anything. Thanks for the super chat from E, who says, The dreams of Aegon feel like a big revelation of a dream of spring. Did they choose to show them now? Because we might never get that book. That is a depressing thought. Like, maybe George knows that he'll never finish the main books, and so he's just trying to put some of those ideas in these TV shows instead. Maybe, maybe on some level, but George uh, is saying that he's determined to finish the series, and we can only hope that he will succeed in that. Um, so, I thought that the scene where Viserys spoke with Daemon, and then Viserys declared that he was disinheriting Daemon and making Rhaenyra his heir instead, I thought that the way that they played that was interesting, because it sort of made it seem as though Viserys was being impulsive, in doing that in the show. Um, look at... Sad demon. Um, like, it, it really seemed as though Viserys was angered by Daemon, who, who told Viserys, you are weak. You're weak, Viserys. And then it's immediately after that that, that Viserys is visibly upset, and so he immediately says, I'm disinheriting you, I'm making Rhaenyra the heir instead. So... It, it seems like a very emotional, in-the-moment reaction, as opposed to something that he really thought about carefully. Um, so, you know, acting impulsively for matters of succession is obviously a pretty dangerous thing to do. But he does also clearly have a lot of confidence in Rhaenyra. Um, but, like, you know, how long has he had that confidence? Because for so long he was saying, I'm going to have a son, I had a prophetic dream, I'm going to have a baby boy that's going to be my heir. But at the same time, he was having Rhaenyra as his cupbearer at council. He always has loved Rhaenyra, and he always has kept Rhaenyra close so that she can learn politics from the council. So, sort of goes both ways. Um, he, he clearly has had respect for Rhaenyra for a long time even as he originally was preferring a male heir. Um, I thought that in the, in the inside the episode, they talk about how Viserys' choice to make Rhaenyra the heir is partly out of guilt for the death of Emma, his wife, uh, on his orders, having her cut open. So, you know, I guess he might see Rhaenyra as sort of embodying Emma's legacy, uh, and for that reason he wants her on the throne. Um, and yeah, like we also see Viserys cutting himself on the throne 
immediately after disinheriting Daemon and making Rhaenyra the heir, immediately cutting himself after changing the succession, which again suggests that he might not be handling power well. Um, any other questions you want me to answer? Uh, I think that we've covered most of what happened in this episode. We got a glimpse of little Lena Valarion. Lena and Lenor are going to become relevant characters later on. Um, I thought the funeral scene was interesting because it was Daemon who speaks kindly and sensitively to Rhaenyra. Like, Daemon is usually seen as a bit of a chaotic dickbag, uh, but in this case, he's saying, like, hey, Rhaenyra, like, your father needs you, like, he's he's trying to offer it a bit of comfort. And it's interesting to see that, that Daemon is the one to do that, you know? Like, he is violent and chaotic, but he also shows concern for people's feelings sometimes. At least Rhaenyra's. He's clearly someone who is sensitive to Rhaenyra's feelings. They're really trying to humanize Daemon a lot in ways that he wasn't in the books so much. Uh, what else is happening in the chat? Uh, I don't know what the little balls are on the small council table. I think it's just a symbol of, like, we're here to chat. We're here to have a meeting. R says the Targaryen hair looks so good. Uh, first time we saw the Blackfire sword. Yeah, so there is this ancient Valyrian steel sword, uh, which is, like, the symbol of Targaryen kingship. And so we get to see it in this scene with Viserys. The location of the Blackfire Sword is a mystery in the time of the main Game of Thrones books 200 years later. Um, and there's a lot of speculation that Blackfire the Sword might turn up again some other time. It's really important who has Blackfire the Sword because it is seen as like whoever has that sword must be the rightful king. Um, and similarly with Dark Sister which is like the other super important ancestral Targaryen Valyrian steel sword, which is wielded by Daemon. So it's a good it's a good idea to keep an eye on those Valyrian steel blades. Um, are we going to release the on the next episode trailer? Uh, I haven't got it right here. We can. All right, do you guys? Maybe we should do like spo spoiler corner. Should we do like a spoiler corner? Um. Thanks for the super chat from Lord Stark, who says, What's your opinion on Viserys forcibly choosing his son over his wife? Um, the episode implied only one could survive, but the creators said they would die regardless. Yeah, I, I thought, I mean, it's very important, isn't it? Like, was Viserys choosing to kill Emma to try and save the baby? Or was Emma definitely going to die anyway? So you might as well try and save the baby, you know? Like, yeah, in the inside the episode, Ryan Condal, the showrunner, said Emma was going to die anyway. But um, if there was any chance of Emma surviving, that makes it more fucked up to cut her open and kill her. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you that it seemed a little bit ambiguous in the episode. But the showrunner seems to say that um, it was Emma was going to die regardless. Thanks for the super chat from Sir, who says, I love your work, keep it up. Which of the Game of Thrones books is your favourite so far? I think my favourite Game of Thrones book is A Storm of Swords, the third book in the main series. Uh, mostly because of the Tyrion stuff. I think Tyrion is probably the best character um, in Game of Thrones. And I think that his sort of climactic confrontation with Tywin is really great and amazing. Um, and a great fulfilment of that whole arc. Um, thanks for the super chat from Osmond, who says that the Valyrian was a really nice touch. Uh, thanks for the super chat from basically a god, um, who asks a sort of a spoilery question. Yeah, we, we won't do the spoilery stuff. I think we're going to wrap up this live stream shortly. Um, maybe we'll just watch the on the next episode thing first. So if you don't want to see the inside the episode, the on the next episode trailer, we're going to watch that, do a little bit of more spoilery speculation so if you're worried about spoilers i suggest that you uh leave we're going to wrap up the live stream shortly and first we're going to watch the on the next episode so we're going to go to youtube and we're going to search they didn't put it on hbo max so um house of the dragon trailer next episode this is going to be really easy to find, isn't it? For sure. Okay, weeks ahead trailer. Let's... Oh my god. Let's watch that together, shall we? 
Um, mm, mm, mm. All right, so we're going to watch the next episode's trailer, so if you don't want to see that, you might want to avoid this. Let's check it out. I've seen most of this footage already. Dragon Keepers. Oh, okay. The prince that was promised. That is the prophecy. They're talking more about the prophecy. That's interesting. We might learn more. Okay. Not expecting that. Oh, what 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 seat is that? Is that where's that meant to be? Is that high tide? The Valerion No, that can't be high tide. Don't know which castle that is. Maybe it is high tide, because that's Corliss there. New oh is that a new character? Caraxes causing a ruckus. Older Rainiera. Dragon Pit. Painted Table. Kragas Crab Feeder. So as you can see, there's going to be conflict between Alicent and Rhaenyra. Big Santa Claus outfit, that's fun. Kristen Cole. Cat's Poor Dagger. True, true. That's what Viserys doesn't want to do. Whoa! Is that Viserys, like, attacking Daemon with a knife? Wow. That's that's intense. Nothing like that in the books. Oh, who are these kids? Yeah, I I think I know which characters those are. They look very strong. Cyrax, Rhaenyra. War in the Stepstones, Corlys and Daemon, doing a war for fun. Vagar, the biggest and oldest dragon in the world. Yeah, sure. That looks like that looks like fire and blood to me. That they are being pretty faithful to the books. Like they've got to make some stuff up, uh, because the books are just a summary, it's just a cliff notes. But um yeah, I mean, generally, I'm pretty happy with this show. I think it looks good. Um, it's going to be interesting, like, later on when there are certain mysteries and there are certain important events that are ambiguous in the books that the show is going to have to clarify and show what really happened. So um, that'll be interesting to see. Um, thanks for the super chat from Entropy, who likes the idea of a spoiler section. Lewis says, what were your thoughts on the Targaryen sigil on the Master of Ceremonies for the jousting fight? Error? What was wrong with the Targaryen sigil? Like, he was just being like a herald and like a representative of the Targaryens, right? Like, it's okay. Yeah, like this guy. You're talking about this guy? I, I, I don't see nothing wrong with that sigil. It's, I mean, the fact that it's black, it's like a black fire sigil. No, I, he's just representing the Targaryens. I, I think that's fine. Um... Disappearing Bunny in the super chat says, Daemon was offered a girl with silver hair. Yeah, so to get a bit spoilery, and again, if, if you don't want any spoilers for season one, I'm going to drop a moderate spoiler for season one. Um, so Daemon and Rhaenyra have a relationship later on. Uncle and niece. Yeah, Targaryen incest. Um, and yeah, I do think that makes it interesting that Mizaria suggests that Daemon have sex with a blonde maiden it suggests that daemon has some ongoing sexual interest in blonde maidens uh, and of course rhaenyra is a blonde maiden so it creates this creepy sort of like sexual grooming thing like daemon is all like sweet on rhaenyra and bringing her gifts uh at the same time that he has a sexual interest in blonde maidens so it's kind of gross the way daemon is um you know, treating Rhaenyra like this, perhaps with the intention of eventually having a sexual relationship with her. Thanks for the super chat from Ethan, who is refreshed by the decent writing. 
Thanks for the super chat from Sam, who says, so when are we getting a time jump? Next step, or are we going back and forth? I think it's going to be mostly linear from now on. Um, we're going to go forwards in time. Um, and there are going to be, according to interviews, there are going to be multiple time jumps. Most of them are going to be like a few years, but there's going to be like a 10-year time jump when we go from uh, young Rhaenyra to uh, adult Rhaenyra and Alicent. Um, so yeah, I don't know when that happens in the season, but like they're already sort of messing with the timeline and like simplifying it. Cause like even the events of just this episode, like Emma dying in childbirth, uh, the, t the tournament, which is in Maidenpool, I think it's the equivalent of the Maidenpool tournament, but they hold it in King's Landing in the show. Um, and Rhaenyra being named heir, like there's years in between those events in the book. Like the book is like this thing happened on this year, then this thing happened the next year, and then the next year this thing happened. Whereas in this episode, they've like compressed um, all of the events into what feels like you know a week or two, uh, which I think makes sense. You know, just to simplify the story, we we don't want to make a complicated timeline. I think those are all good choices. Um, I'm yeah. So I'm curious to see what else they change, what else they bring in. Um, but overall, I'm pretty optimistic about this show I, I think that it'll be fun for like the book nerds i don't know if the casual watchers are going to be super into it but i think for book nerds it's going to be a fun time and we're going to make a explained video to uh cover each like more fully summarize and analyze each episode uh that'll come out around thursday or friday and we're going to keep doing live streams immediately after each episode, 10, 15 p.m. Eastern Time, Sundays. So like and subscribe. Might want to follow on Twitter. Um, but yeah, we won't do too much more. Like, I, like it, it's weird because all the spoilers are out there. Like anyone can read Fire and Blood. Anyone can. I mean, even like the World of Ice and Fire has a very short uh, and succinct summary of everything that's going to happen in this show. Uh, it's all on the wikis as well. Um but I don't know. I don't really want to sit here and just tell you everything that's going to happen. Um, I think it's going to be more fun to go along with the ride week by week. So, all right, we're going to wrap up this live stream. There's going to be videos coming. It's going to be more streams. And uh, it's going to be a good time. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll leave this live stream up on the channel, um, at least until the explained video comes out, just so it's easy to find. But I think afterwards it'll go on the podcast channel. So you might like to subscribe to the Alt Shift X podcast on YouTube or Spotify or your podcast app. Might possibly do some like chats with other Game of Thrones Z creator people throughout the season, if we have time, hopefully, on the podcast. So it might be worth subscribing. Uh, thanks for chucking those links in the chat, Schubert. There is also a Patreon. Uh, Patreon supporters can get a little bit of access to some little sneak peeks and chats in the Discord, early updates, early access to videos. Since it's so time sensitive, it'll probably just be like a few hours. Patrons will get videos early because like, you know, I don't want to wait a day because these videos are only like up to date for a short amount of time. But uh, thanks to everyone who supports on Patreon. Thanks to everyone who watches. Happy to have you all here. Happy to chat. Always happy to hear your thoughts. And uh, we'll be back soon. Have a good one. Cheers.